Hi and welcome everybody. We are live right now and thank you very much for tuning in to another edition of the Tech Talk Travel Collective Series. My name is Leah Jordan and I'm representing Tech Talk Travel. We started in early April with the first collective series and we had the first sessions for hoteliers and technology providers and just last Monday we had a session for consultants already. The idea behind this format is to open to open up a, a discussion forum for the various disciplines in our industry to exchange and pollinate ideas and to speak about sentiments about the current situation. And this very session today is the session about our industry's next generation. It is intended as an open exchange for hotel students, students for recent graduates and uh, representatives of hotel schools and educational institutions. And the focus is really to discuss the impact of the current situation and what is happening right now on the very role of these students and the next generation and the young talent within our industry. This is a live session and we are streaming live right now in this very second on Facebook and LinkedIn. And I'm welcoming every single one of you tuning in. Thank you very much for joining. And I hope you will stay with us for the next 60 to 90 minutes. Um, I'm very confident that this is going to be a very interesting conversation, especially when I look at the great panel that will join us today. But said all this, I also want to, um, to shout out to you guys to feel very extra invited to leave your comments anytime, your questions, your remarks in the comment section, and we will try to cover all your questions as well during the session. So this is intended as a open session and you are an active part of this conversation. So, and before I introduce you to our wonderful panel, there's something I'd like to highlight because I feel it's very important to um, point that out. And the aim of this live session is definitely not to draw any conclusions or map out what is going to happen for anyone in the industry. Um, because if we're really honest, every one of us, nobody really knows what is going to happen. And this is um, really, really um, an extraordinary situation we're all in. Um, so it is rather to be seen as a opportunity to embrace the option to talk to each other, keep the dialogue going and learn from each other and just know what is going on and yeah, stay connected. So that all said, um, I'll move now to introduce um, our great panelists and we have five wonderful people joining this conversation. And as I let them in one by one and I start with Dr. Achim Schmidt. Hi Achim. Welcome morning, and thank you so much Welcome for joining. Welcome from Switzerland. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you. And Dr. Achim is a, Dr. Achim Schmidt is a professor of strategic management and associate dean of graduate programs at EHL Ecole Hotelier de Lausanne. And it's super great you're with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Great. Then we're moving on. And the second one um, joining us today is Bente Hifiyun. Yes. Welcome. Good morning. Bente. Good thank morning. You from Amsterdam, is that right? Yes, correct. Yes, Bente is a last year student of the Bachelor of Business Administration and Hotel Management Program at Hotel School Die Haag. Thank you for joining, Bente. Thank you for having me. Then, um, thirdly, we have also joining from the Netherlands, um, the wonderful Dana Jimenez Herrera. Welcome, Dana. <laughs> Good morning, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Dana is joining from, Schre from Schreveningen, which is a, a, an excellent campus in The Hague, of Hotel School The Hague. And Dana is a lecturer and trainer for leadership skills and mentoring, and also the project leader of the current project, Practic Practical Placement Experience at Hotel School The Hague. Thank you so much, Dana, for being with us. Thank you for having me. So then we move on. And I led into the round um, Zina Ritter. Hi and welcome, Zina. Great that Hi. you're with us. Zina is a current and soon to be graduated student of the Master of Science in Global Hospitality Business, a unique program created in partnership with the Polytechnic University of Hong Kong and the University of Houston at studying at the EHL Ecologia de Lausanne as well. Thank you, Zina, for joining. It's very great to have you. Thanks for having me. And then last but not least, and I'm super excited as well to have another one joining from Amsterdam. Hi, Jasmine. Jasmine Oruch. Hey, Leah. Hi. <laughs> Great to take the time to join us. Um, Jasmine is a senior lecturer of marketing and innovation and a research fellow at Hotel School Die Hague as well, but based at the campus in Amsterdam, right? Yes, correct. Perfect. So great. So we're ready to go. And before we start and 
like dig into the topics right away. I quickly also for the audience joining us right now live on Facebook and LinkedIn, I quickly want to give a bit of a background how we set up this um, agenda for today because we do have an agenda. And we at Tech Talk Travel, we um, intentionally do not set the agenda for our attend, like for the uh, panelists. And because we really think, feel it is very important to reflect the topics and um, issues that really do matter to that specific segment of the industry. So we asked every attendee to submit their key points that they feel are very important to themselves. Um, so all, all said now, I think we're ready to go. And um, for the time frame again, it's we, we're looking at 60 to 90 minutes to come. And well, let's just start. And to start off, um, something that I feel is um, very interesting to hear for the audience, and this is the perspective we're actually most interested in, I feel, is a question I'll pose to you two first, Bente and Sina, and maybe we start with Bente and Sina right after, is how did you actually experience the first face and the initial beginning of this crisis. How was that for you and how do you feel about it today? Yeah, I think um, we adapted quite quickly. So everything moved online, which uh, at first was not much of a challenge. Everything um, went in the way that it was supposed to go. The only main difference that I really experienced was from a student perspective, um, we really missed having that interaction. Normally when you sit together with a team and work on a project, you um, you laugh in between and you have lunch together or you have drinks after. Whereas right now, whenever you have a, a meeting, you set a meeting and usually you all you discuss during that meeting is related to the project that you're working on in that time. So mainly the, the high touch and the personal aspect um, of a team and of students. Yeah, I see. Sina, how was that for you? Um, well, for us, it was quite special because as you mentioned before my master's program is um, it's on three continents and this semester we were in Bangkok um, so first of all um, when all of this happened we didn't only have to change to online classes we all had to get back home to <laughs> which um, you know was for depending on the country kind of um, you know a hassle and, and uh, an adventure too and um, but it was um, it was very well um, prepared from um, from our university. Uh, the online courses went very well. It all went very quick, and um, yeah, as Bente said, it's um, you know it's different. It's different online. Um, the interaction is missing. Um, the face to face is missing. It's different just being at home in your room. Um, and even more, we're from 17 countries, so it's it's kind of hard to have group projects um, over continents, you know, with time zones and, you know, everything. But um, it's a challenge, but I feel like we're coping quite well with it. So well, that, that sounds good so far, though, I have to say. Um, a question to you three, representing the ones having to tell the students something that's going to change due to the current situation. How was that for you in the initial phase? When did you actually realize this is serious? And how did you cope with that? How did you set up the communication strategy with your students? And maybe we start here with uh, Jasmine. Yeah, sure. Uh, actually, it was a week before it went into, for our country, the intelligent lockdown that I had a class with my uh, precious and inspiring MBA students that we said it's almost not a question of if, but when it's going to happen. Not saying that we were prepared for it, but somehow that gave me a twist in mind to say like, yeah, we have to see how to create a, a mind shift almost. And then three days later, it all happened. And yeah, I must say, I, I get goosebumps when I talk about this. I'm so proud of, of like all hospitality institutes, but I'm, I'm representing Hotel School The Hague. We, t we turned around in like two, three days, the mind shift was there with everybody. And it was like, we need to care for our students. We need to see how they're doing. And of course we didn't have answers on how to do that all yet, but that we were all in it together, connecting with our students, how they were doing. I think that created, I don't want to say positive vibe because it's a very challenging situation, but somehow gave us all the spirit to just go. Right. Achim, how was it uh, from your perspective in Switzerland? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, the, the similar, I can echo what my, my peers said. I mean, it uh, took us a little bit uh, um, in, into a, a hustle for two, three days, I would say. Um, we at the, at the master's level, we had a little bit of a particular situation. We have a program, an EMBA program with China, 
in Singapore and we have a campus in Singapore. So we were in, in end of January, I taught in, in the last module that I had was in Singapore and then basically China shut down um, um, in February. So we knew somehow that there was something going on, but we didn't know whether or not this comes and how quickly it comes and uh, um, how drastic it comes. So um, I think that, the, the, that took us a little bit by surprise the, by, the, by the intensity with which we needed to fly out our students, inform our uh, the parents, actually make sure that everybody is safe and sound to locate all of our students in an international uh, programs. But we did this uh, pretty well and it shows that uh, yeah, we have, uh, I think, like uh, other schools, uh, um, when I compare hospitality schools to other universities, I think we have a very good service orientation towards our students and we, we came good together in, in managing this crisis. Right, I understand. And Dana, you have a very special view on that as well, I guess, since you were dealing with the practical students that were actually sent off just shortly before all of this started. And how many were there students that were gone for their practical placements? Um, yeah, this, it's, um, lo uh, um, we had in, in total 185 students who um, had to interrupt their internship, but um, it's a very um, diverse group. Some, some of the students didn't even start the internship yet, and uh, some, um, actually a few even have still two who are on their internship, one in Singapore and one in Amsterdam even. So they can see uh, this, this when it comes to practical placement, there's a lot of variety we have to deal with as well. And um, um, with placement, we it started earlier that we realized the severity of the situation because we knew already from indeed from China and Singapore and then it came to Europe but yeah on the day we received the email that actually our premises would close I had my last workshop with my which my leadership students and we they were asking me what do you what do you think are we going to close and I definitely underestimated the situation because I told them no I, I just assumed that we will still at least finish your block, your course, and that you will be able to do your assessment. Well, I was clearly wrong with that. So, yeah, very honest of you to say, but that, that I can add from the conversations we had beforehand as well with other segments of the industry. In hindsight, everyone is kind of admitting that they were underestimating the situation by far. Um, yeah, moving from this, because this opens up and leads right into the question that actually um, was submitted by you, Bente. And, um, oh no, sorry, it was a question question submitted by Sina, but I think it's a question that I'd like you to answer both of you, Sina and Bente, and then I would like to go first with Sina though. And like taking the current situation, how would you describe the students' expectations right now? And what are actually fears and problems you may, may be facing um, when looking at your personal, but also on your professional situation for now and the time to come, let's say like the next, well, this is a hard time to say, like the next half a year probably we can look at. Um, so to you know maybe follow up on the um, on the fears and um, the problems first, um, I guess everyone you know depending on the situation they're in faces different issues. Um, but for me as a current student, um, you know I'm I'm almost in my last semester and I'm you know the fear is to not find a job, um, to not find a job in the industry that I actually want to go to. Um, the you know there's going to be an oversupply in skilled graduates um you know there's more and more graduating and um, there will be an oversupply um which you know cannot be taken in by the demand um then um you know it's there's a, a lot of uncertainty in um, new challenges um you know roles might change um everything that we knew could be could be could be gone it could be different um also you know depending on how long this goes, um, we'll have to build up uh, the industry from scratch more or less again, um, which, you know, is also an opportunity, of course, but it's also um, with all of this uncertainty, um, a challenge. And um, it's also an emotional burden. Um, it's Corona is always in the media. It's always around us. It's, it's very present. There's uh, no break emotionally um, about the uncertainty that we're facing. Um, and your second question about um, the expectations, um, did I, was I, was, am I correct that you asked about the expectations um, that we have in, in hospitality education? Well, not education itself, but more like what, what, what are you expecting for yourself to come now in these months? Like when you're looking at your sentiment, like 
Mm -hmm. Which state are you at? Well, um, there will definitely be new roles evolving, probably, you know, uh, which we don't even know about yet, depending on um, how how this will, will end, let's say it that way. Um, you know, travel is, a, is you know, is going to come back. People will always want to travel. Um, the industry will... Um, We'll get back into the new normal, but it will settle down from from what it's facing right now, and the industry will be built back up. And this is a big opportunity for us. Um, you know, we'll just have to find a way how to bridge this in a in a nice way. You know, without, as I said, losing it too much emotionally too. And um, for now, we'll just have to go with the flow to say it. Well. Thank you, Tina. That sounds like you, you're in a good position and have at least like a positive outlook when putting the challenges aside. Bente, how do you feel right now? What would you say are the major concerns that you think about and your peers are discussing about right now? Yeah, I think in terms of expectations, what I personally learned most from, from this virus is that we should not really have any expectations. I think there's a lot of uncertainty that is going on at the moment and, um, as you just said, yeah, we were not expecting it to go this rapidly and it did. So that shows that we really kind of have no clue what's going to come. Um, personally, I'm in a very good situation. I'm almost done. I'm currently uh, writing my thesis and going on internship in September, which is still going to happen. And I went on my practical placement and I had my practical education. So I'm very lucky in a sense that um, people who are currently may have just started, they do not get the same experience living on campus. They um, they might not get the same experience with regards to practical education and practical placement, etc. Which I think is a big challenge because um, they they might worry if they have enough practical experience in order to be able to find a job after studying. And then with regards to personal, but also still professional. I think one of the main advantages of being um, in such a close community and seeing each other every day is that you really build a network and building a network is much harder um, when everything is done remotely. So I think that's also a challenge and a concern among students. That's a good point, Ryan. Thank you. Dana, like if you, because you're dealing with all the practical students right now that, that came back, and that's actually the one that Bente just referred to. That's the one of the first year, right? It's not the ones that had been abroad already. And a quick note to the audience joining us, maybe not being familiar with the hotel school setup. So the students, they usually, they have a big part of a practical education element as well involved. So they go and work in hotels operationally and later on also in management stages. And that obviously now is a challenge. So Dana, could you agree on what Bente and Sina were, were um, describing? Can you observe that with your students as well that you're dealing with right now? Yeah, definitely. When it comes to practical education, it includes two parts. Huh? We have indeed the, our placements, uh, our internships with external companies involved, which are very important. And um, also we have our practical education in our own campuses, which right now is also on hold and we need to develop or we have been already providing alternative um, learning experiences for students. And um, for one thing, I think with the placement, what we did well with those 185 students uh, who had to interrupt um, their internship right now. So from this semester, we offered um, an alternative working really closely with the industry together. And within just a matter of, of days, we organized a project with more than 55 industry partners where we realized this mini internship. So right now we have students uh, working online in teams with companies in the, of the hospitality industry and um, doing real projects with them instead of us providing them with real cases which are at the end yeah not um, not providing them with a the learning experience they would get on the internship because on the internship it is important that they get that contact outside from school you know Right. Yeah, well, we're lucky enough as Tech Talk Travel as well to be um, able and one of the ones to support in this program. So we're actually working right now with uh, two groups of students on an online project. 
And since I'm an alumni as well of Hotel School de Hago, I've been to this process as well. I do see the challenge very much that this um, human touch is missing a lot. So the, the, you learn a lot right during your studies as well by having this inter industry um, touch points. Um, so Achim, from your perspective from EHL, how, how is it for you at the um, EHL covering this and solving the problem of how to provide a practical education now with a social distancing and looking at the legal and social regulations, probably this is for a time to come and it's not going to go away. So I'm interested to hear about that. Yeah, I think in that respect, we were a little bit uh, um, lucky. Uh, we made a, our leadership team in 2017. Uh, um, we decided to actually go digital and uh, follow this trend um, and actually um, create a lot of, we have an online MBA right now, uh, established that is uh, fully credit bearing as other other programs as well and we had started already this discussion in our teams um, yeah for, for a while right now to discuss how can we actually make sure that we have certain practical components uh, um, maybe not ha happening anymore and taking them into a virtual wor world where it's possible um, we we did with uh, um, I don't know if it, there's some some video shots in, in on the internet where we have virtual guest rooms where you have like a, a virtual reality 3D glasses that you actually go through the guest room and pick and you can um, select what is wrong and what is not wrong. So we, we are already very, very, um, we have some uh, certain ideas how to do this, but um, I have to say, um, to be quite honest, there are limitations in doing this. Um, what happens right now and what most people probably or, or most most universities in, in the urgency have done is they took in, they, they've taken a, a, a practical or physical course and put it into an online world. So so basically you try to, to put it there and then you all of a sudden realize what's happening here, what's 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 working, what's not working. Um, and then um, once you figure that out, then all of a sudden you, you come up with new ideas and, and new tools and see like, hey, there's actually different, probably not the same, but there are different ways of doing certain things. I think this is uh, um, very interesting to see how you can um, sometimes, where, where you didn't even expect it, um, make sure that the students have a certain uh, practical experience as well. Um, I mean, we have we have certain wine tastings where we have uh, um, similar wine types, and then you describe them over the internet. Of course, it's not the same that, that being in a classroom, but there are certain things if you set them up properly. Um, and you invest a little bit of time in creative thinking, which our industry is known for. I think that there are ways how you can create um, the practical components in the virtual world. And this, as I mentioned before, was a trend that the industry anyway had. And it's a trend that is anyway ongoing. I think uh, we are just now accelerating this trend and, and make sure that we um, need to do this faster than previously expected. Wow, great, I see. And so it's it's really like a time of try and error right now for most of us, probably. And um, um, Jasmine, from your perspective, um, you, you're very, very much involved as well in research, but do you have touch mm -hmm. point with the practical students and how do you experience that? Uh, I don't have direct touch points with practical students at this moment in time, but I do have touch points with uh, the, the phase where Bent is in right now, which is our last phase where students are going to do their uh, final course, so to say, uh, which is called launching your career. Uh, and students also have to do a placement component uh, there and some underpinning, which is then done by research. And what we actually see, I mean, I very much agree with uh, Dr. Schmidt with Achim to say like, yeah, I think we're known to be a creative industry, finding creative solutions, so to say, because we try to prepare our students for change. That is what we what we do in a hospitality institution. Now, I agree with Dana. I would be uh, naive to say that, that, that this would be a great change for us to prepare for a pandemic crisis. But yeah, it gives us also the hands, as I'm a very positive person, to say, like, how can we twist this around now? And now, actually, from our hospitality research center, um, uh, together with, with, of course, the entire institute, we want our students also to, to be inspired, to, to also almost become thought leaders. So we have set up a stream for our last phase students where they weren't able to maybe right away start their final management placement to conduct research. And actually within this current COVID-19 situation, because we also don't have the answer. So to co-create together with them and to also let them 
uh, feel and see what the industry is doing and give them a very responsible role. And, and we have almost 100 students doing that right now. And I must say, again, I'm a very positive uh, person. COVID-19 won't uh, uh, harm me, hopefully, uh, too much, but it works. Students get very engaged and they find articles and things and insights which we haven't maybe seen yet. And they also engage with the industry specifically. And that then, uh, I'm very proud to say also some of the companies students were already at for their final placement said, okay, we will move part online for you. You can still stay with us. You will have an assignment, see how school can support you with that. So although the high touch is something I think as a reflection that is really missing and we more and more embrace how important that is, so to say, we create high touches in creating synergy and engagement and online webinars and we somehow start to, to connect on that level. So yeah, from, from a research and placement perspective, if you will, I see a lot of opportunities. I'm not downfolding the critical situations because they are definitely there. I'm not going to let the sun only shine now, um, but I want to give some motivation to really showcase there are things possible and we have to take ownership of that. I, I agree. And um, I'm gonna, um let me check, quickly check because you just mentioned co-creation, right, Jasmine, and um, a way to tackle the the missing high touch. And you mentioned webinar as a as a as a feasible measure that you could apply. What are other measures, I think, that you at EHL, for example, are embracing right now to minimize this missing high touch with the students and the personal connection you have had in the lectures before? So, um, I mean, basically, we had. Uh, um, with all our uh, speak now from for the master's program uh, where Zina is there to make it maybe more relevant and uh, uh, to make sure that they, I'm not saying anything that is not out of my scope but uh, in the end of the day what we what we did is like um, we are investing a little bit more a human touch in it by following individually up with the students so um, all our students around the world have, have received calls and, and uh, uh, check-ins, not only academic check-ins, but also um, basically mental and, and emotional check-ins to, to see how they are doing, um, how's the situation there. I mean, um, imagine just um, all the students that go back to their countries. I mean, the, the implementation of, of distance learning courses um, sets aside or, 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 or pre-assumes that there's actually access from every house to a good internet um, and, and a Wi-Fi connection or um, that students have the, the capability of uh, having their laptops and can stream and, and everything goes smoothly. But I mean, that's the ideal uh, case. I can tell you in, in 50 or 80 percent of the cases, this is not the ideal case. And uh, they, they are much more of these. I think these touch points are equally important and these human touch points with the students are equally important right now not only about the the academic curriculum and think about this i mean this is a unique crisis that has certain social implications for all of us and emotional implications for all of us so what we tried to do um, very consciously is that in all our programs we have we have teams we have um, i mean we're, we're talking about three three thousand students so we have uh, um, more than 200, 300 staff members actually making sure that we are in, in touch, that we are always making sure also within our teams that we are um, helping each other out when, when, when there's a difficulty in, in teaching um, or communicating with students or also communicating in between each other. So I would say like um, when, when this high touch experience um, now comes into place, it's not only about making sure maybe that, that you give a call to someone and said like, hey, can you follow the course? But we also enlarge this concept, if I may answer this in this uh, respect, your question, to enlarge it to the to these COVID circumstances where we said like, look, it's not only about the academics. We are, um, these are our students, these are our staff members, these are our teams um, and our industry partners as well. Um, and we need to make sure that we are in, in touch with them. And when you have that, all of a sudden you realize that they say, hey, actually, can I come and speak to your students? So we have probably similar to my colleagues, we had we had uh, industry speakers coming to our sessions. We had we had we, we create free um, um, free panels that probably also um, colleagues have done where we do sharings about what's happening in the industry. And I think this this 
this um, connection that you need to seek in those circumstances allows you then also to find new possibilities where you can create again more touch point moments and i think uh, our industry is very um, good in creating uh, future opportunities and service opportunities for our students and our staff right i would thank like you. i would like to add on, on that if that's possible yeah thank you because um i think in addition to that we need to proactively reach out much more to our students than we already do it's also important that we create those touch points or interactions amongst uh, them right now in the online courses that we have and with the first courses now that we had given online have given online and we we see i mean we are already a small scale institution so our classes are already small but a class of 15 online is still in my opinion too, too big to create that or now from my little experience that i have too big to create that uh, exchange and the interaction that we usually have so we're probably uh, we're thinking about now that we in the, in the in the coming courses to even reduce the size to even five or six all right, so which which will also increase the time invested, right? And because that's also something yeah. interesting, and I'd like to hear that from Sina and Bente as well, because there's many people um, on social media, at least, and in the media in general, there's many tips on how to use your extra time. Do you feel you have extra time to, due to the situation? Bente, maybe we start with you and then Sina. Um, that depends how you place it. I think if I'm a bit of a procrastinator, so I like to think I have extra time, but then I actually don't, and then I have to um, end up having to hurry at the end. Uh, but no, I definitely don't have extra time. Um, until the beginning of this block, I was still working for school as well, and I helped with uh, setting everything up and moving everything online, which was a lot of work and really, um, I think, something that if you're not involved in it, you cannot grasp how much work it actually is to realize everything and, and make change everything into the online situation as we currently have it. So I think that mainly was a lot of work. And then, um, of course, a benefit is the reduced travel time. So not having to travel to work or school um, gives you some extra time, but that's maybe 20 minutes a day. And I think apart from that, um, we definitely are very busy and I think something that is harder online than in person is actual personal interactions and understanding what someone is saying. You cannot see um, see someone's posture and you cannot see someone's hand gestures, with, which might sometimes make it harder to, to understand the message that someone is trying to bring across and uh, leading to longer meetings than you would actually have in person. So I think um, from my opinion, I definitely don't have much extra time. Right, that's a very important, interesting point you're bringing up, and we move to this right after. And Sina, how is that for you? Do you feel you have actually more time, and you're you're left with so much extra time now due to the situation? I absolutely don't. Um, we had quite, um, you know, because we also additionally um, lost some time in the semester through, you know, traveling back home um, and everything. Um, so we had quite um, a tough semester. I'm now in the exam phase so it's, it's almost over uh, in a week um, but as uh, Benti also said um, all the group meetings um, which are uh, as mentioned before for us intercontinentally uh, with the time zones and everything it makes it much more time consuming because usually you could just meet quickly after class or discuss it through a break in class um, and now um, it's an extra time that you kind of have to take, you know, until everyone logged in and then you have the meeting. And um, it really is true that you can, it's not the same interaction online um, just because, yeah, the face-to-face -face kind of is missing. And um, therefore, um, I also think I don't really have more time. Um, maybe, yeah, in Bangkok, the way to school and back was about one and a half to two hours, depending on traffic. So of course, I'm also saving time on that. But um, generally, the workload stays the same, uh, might even be a bit increased through um, the challenges that this brings. Wow. And then looking again, and to the additional like challenges we're facing in adapting to the change, um, I want to move to the topic that was uh, already touched by Bente is communication and actually remote working and then also remote leadership. And that was a topic that was submitted by you, Dana. Um, you put remote leadership on the list. And um, what is the importance of communication and other people's skills when working together, especially now, like remotely from different places in the world, only virtually? Um, what is your take on that? Well, what I've um, noticed now is uh, that I th 
think all the leadership skills that we teach our students throughout our four-year course um, um, are still important. I think even even more important. The corona really amplifies that. Yeah, we're starting from from the communication skills, really basic things like listening skills, teamwork, uh, motivation, all your self motivation, but also how do I who how do I motivate my teams? Um, but then now in the setting, how do I do that remotely when I do not see them? And um, that is something that I think now we, in the coming weeks, we need to have a really close look into how do we can still support the current course in this, and but also in the future, in the long run. All right. Jasmine, from your perspective, what do you think? Is there a change in leadership or the skills that we need? Um, I don't think there is a necessarily change. We don't change as a human from one day to another, but we, the way we propose it, and especially as part of our institutional plan also, of course we focus on the EQ component and the IQ component with emotional intelligence and, and um, uh, intellectual quotient. We now very much also focus on the adversity, the resilience component here, because if you look at, at factors, which also uh, Dr. Schmidt Achim also said, uh, it's not even so much, of course, I don't want to downgrade my marketing content, but it's very much about the how you are doing the things right now. And that is for us as a lecturer, but also for students. How do you do that? And that comes also with the resilience and adversity and almost complying with um, concerning for health and well-being. And that is something that really put forward um, the practice we do. Like my first class, I remember as the day of yesterday within COVID-19 I was the first uh, the first one to welcome our MBA students where I'm hosting a course and um, I thought oh I need to really uplift my content and really showcase I worked hard with all the online tech tools I did that but I took 55 minutes to say how are you every one of them was given one minute from uh, Vietnam to India to Amsterdam and that is how we checked in. I had set my whole PowerPoint aside and I just took a cup of tea and I said, how are you? And then I got feedback. I know some of them are also in the room probably today that that was the best way to start instead of going like, so module number five, where are we? And I did that at the end also, which meant that from a leadership perspective for me, but also for them, you need to, I think also you have less time because the content that we weren't able to cover in the set period of time needs to be delivered in a different way because the assessment still complies with that. So back to your question there, I think the resilience component, the adversity is something as a backpack of hospitality inspirator that you should comply with. And yeah, we do that from left and right, but I think we can, we can really, really, really improve altogether on doing something with that. All right, great. Um, then we, we touched before already a little bit on co-creation, Jasmine. There was a point that you added, right? Do you feel that we did we cover the points that you were intending to cover with the topic of co-creation in the current situation? Yes, for sure. I think also all right. the input we all discussed. Sure, sure. All right, because then um, I'd like to add a question we got from the audience. And um, let me open it up. It's a question from Kunal Bhati, and I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Thank you very much, Kunal, for adding the question. He's Global Head of Strategic Partnerships um, Sales and Account Management at Trivago. And his question is, and I pose it to the group, um, and then we just go... Um, as we go. We heard a little about it. However, can we elaborate on the options that students graduating right now will have and have looking at the current situation? So how would you answer that question? Can I start? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so I'm actually currently in the um, research program, which Jasmine briefly described. So I'm currently doing my research. And I think it's um, going very well. I think uh, quite often students first do their practical or their management internship, so the practical aspect, um, and then uh, do research during or after, but now it's, um, it shows that most students are actually doing research. And uh, there's been a change because rather than having to um, Work, guide ourselves in a sense. We have meetings every week with a coach as a group. So we've been divided into groups which topics are aligned in one way or another. Um, and I have had two meetings so far. In the first week we had a meeting in which we basically got to know each other. And then at the end we covered um, our to-dos. And then this week um, it uh, was noticed that not all students were up to date. So then uh, they, we move to an individual approach, but it's really nice having that one contact moment every week and um, seeing 
or, or knowing that that's going to happen and then having a deadline because it can be quite hard to motivate yourselves. And I think that's definitely a benefit. And yeah, as I said earlier, for me, um, my internship is still going to happen. So I'm starting in September and um, hopefully I will year. manage to, to graduate this year. But I understand that people who are looking to do an internship in events, for example, that it can be much more difficult. So I think it really depends on the industry or the, the aspect of the industry that you would like to go into, um, to which extent you can make this possible to graduate this year. Sina, for you, because you mentioned already that you are like in the phase now as well, entering the industry, how would you answer the question? Well, there will definitely be opportunities which we might not see yet, um, depending on um, how we go with all of this. Um, there's, you know, many industries or um, many things which will are on the, you know, are upcoming right now. Um, you know, just for an example, deliveries are booming and everything. And if you can um, kind of tie something that is very successful right now into our industry and maybe create something together that we don't even see yet. Um, this might create opportunities which we can um, get into. Um, I really hope the industry is not going to lose out on too much talent, which is now around, um, you know, because as I said, the demand is not cannot ca catch the supply at the moment or will not be able to. And, um, you know, I just hope that there will be a lot of opportunities, a lot of creative minds that will um, figure out how we can create opportunities for the future all right this is a very important important point you mentioned because when we're looking back at the time right before the corona crisis the number one topic on every stage in the industry was we have a lack of talent and we don't have enough talent in the industry we don't have enough people and now there's so many people being laid off and unfortunately losing their jobs or being furloughed so this is going to be very interesting to see and yes for the industry itself it's probably very important to see that we don't lose all our talents to other industries now especially um, let me pass that to you as well, Achim. What is your viewpoint on that? Like students, like having this great education of hospitality management and then potentially leaving our industry, will this yeah. be still a factor for us? I think you touch upon a, a, a very um, important factor that we see also in our placements. And I think my Yasmin and Dana may, may observe this as well in, in The Hague. Um, the, uh, what is actually something very beautiful of our students is that they are able to listen uh, and, and respond to customer needs. And uh, right now there are a lot of new uh, customer needs in other industries. And uh, um, what we see is uh, exactly what you, you touched upon, Lea, that there are a lot of other industries, consumer industries, uh, um, sales industries, uh, marketing industries, uh, luxury industries, other areas that are very interested in our talent from our schools um, and uh, I think one, one banker once mentioned it to me and said that look I can take care of all the finances and can train people but I cannot take care so much about how they listen to a client and how they respond to their needs so um, in that respect I think there's there is certainly um, a place in other industries for our talent and um, I'm I think that that there are this trend is again it's, it's not something that is new, but maybe probably also some students right now think about outside the box and said like where can I go, but uh, that creates on the other end a little bit the, the the what you mentioned as well is like look we had already our scarce industry and uh, um, we 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 lack talent in our industry and how can we make sure that there is enough talent coming on. So my take, I mean, it's a little bit of crystal ball um, that we look into right now to say, like, what will happen in, in six months and how will the job market be? So um, and I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of making um, too many uh, eventualities and, and think about what could be. And in the end, it's a waste of time. But um, what, what I truly believe is that um, every time there was a downturn in the 2008, 2001, 97 in, 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 in in the Asian crisis, 91, if you want, in the Argentinian crisis, everything you saw that um, graduates throughout those years, actually what they do is they probably make sure that they build up competences and strength. So um, because they know when they come out on the market, there's what Sina mentioned in the beginning that, okay, you, you, you lack a year in, in going to the job market. The following year, there is the other wave coming from behind you. So you have a 
you have more talent on the market and all of a sudden you need to make sure that you are very attractive for any employer. Plus in the current situation um, with all the new implementations, uh, um, changes that we may uh, have in the future about it. So I think there's there's probably um, also something that, that the students and the options that they have when they graduate, some students may think to even take another degree on or go into maybe a technical degree or, or make an add-on with a master's degree if they're bachelor students. Um, so I think there's, there's probably um, certain options. National hotels, national markets will open. They need to recruit. Maybe the international dimensions may be a little bit more difficult. I'm talking work visas, um, entry possibilities. So I, th I think there's there, there there are options there, but these options are probably um, um, yeah a little bit more um, competitive at the times. Also, uh, that students need to be a little bit more proactive in their their um, career aspirations. I was I was mute. Uh, Benton, would you would you say this is uh, true for you as well? Do you uh, consider for yourself as well investing in additional education, or do you feel this competitive uh, environment intensifying for yourself as a student looking at the next year to come? Yeah, I don't know. I don't really. So far, uh, as I said earlier, I'm trying to just let everything happen and uh, see later on. I am considering. Uh, doing a master's more than I was before, uh, but that might not really have anything to do with, with the current situation, I'm not sure. Um, but I think we have to see what happens and what works for you as a person. For example, I am more a practical person. I like doing rather than um, really studying. So I think for me, in order to not miss out on any potential experience, it might work better to to simply launch my career and and stay within the industry afterwards rather than going back to studying. But I think for others um, who are uncertain and would like to really work in hotels, for example, then that might be a good option in order to um, make yourself stand out from, from the others if we do end up having a lot of graduates all looking for jobs at the exact same time, which is what's most likely uh, going to happen, of course. All right, then thank you very much. Let's move on. And we, we, we were discussing now everything about today, like studying, managing, and educating today. Um, there's a, a last point I had in this category, and I quickly want to ask you, Jasmine, if you if you quickly want to just open up. And you mentioned the point of uh, moving from the guest journey to the stakeholder journey. Is this something yeah. that we, we should discuss as well? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Leah. Yeah, very much so. Um, being a hotel school graduate myself as well, I mean, uh, born and raised in a hospitality family, the guest is, is always at the centerpiece and whoever the guest is, that is the one you look at their needs, wants, their job to be done. How can you comply with that? And I think uh, more and more also based on the research I'm doing myself, over the past years already, stakeholder management is something of travel, like crucial importance to look at. And I think, especially in the case where we are right now, with stakeholder, I almost want to call it the stakeholder journey, as you nicely put, Leah, who are all involved to service this guest? Because you have your suppliers, you need to care for them. Because as a hotel, if you are currently running five or 10% occupancy, because you are still able to be open, or if you are closed down, there will be a moment where we're slowly heading towards two, as we can see from the news from the US having some, uh, um, areas where they run 30% occupancy or from China with domestic tourism a lot, we are getting back on track very slowly. So we need these people again. It's not only the guests we need. And mind you, I mean, I think there is a new layer towards our industry where hygiene and safety are becoming of trivial importance, which is a need of our customers, but also like of our guests, of our employees, of any stakeholder involved. So I think as a graduate looking for um, an opportunity to pursue, as Benta said, you can create a unique value proposition by getting some insights on that to help domestic uh, operators, maybe I'm, I'm even saying campsites, I'm even saying rental, rental uh, villas, anything as such, you can make a difference to look at it from all the different stakeholders involved and their needs and then specify on one or two of them. So that was the point I wanted to raise to say we don't only put the guests at the center and don't get me wrong, it's my most important uh, stakeholder to look at, but there are a lot more stakeholders who are also concurrently having a lot of needs and care to be looked after. 
All right. Is there anything, any one of you in the group wanting to add to this? All right, because then I, if there's no one that wants to add something, I would move on now to the second part of our conversation. And now we would like start looking at tomorrow, preparing for tomorrow and what about everything what is to come. And I'd like to open this up with a question that you submitted, Achim. And you said the way forward, um, what does the COVID-19 crisis mean for hospitality schools in the future? Um, when looking at the future for hospitality education, and post COVID-19, what will be the challenges and what changes do you anticipate and perhaps prepare for already? Maybe you also God, start. Uh, at, at, at times, I, I regret having asked myself this question uh, because uh, um, no, I think the, the um, what, what we learned from, from COVID-19 is um, something that in general, I think the, the safety and uh, Im emotional implications of COVID-19 put um, our certain certain aspects of our academic curriculum uh, that we may not neglect, but, but uh, um, they, they got more emphasized right now. So what I'm saying is, um, I think the, the, the safety, the, the worries um, that we have actually um, um, processes and, and, and practices in place that can guarantee um, the safety of our students um, and not only the, the psychological safety, I'm also taking the, the mental safety of our students. I think this is something that um, COVID-19 put uh, on the agenda um, more than before. And I think this is something that we um, need to think about um, how we integrate this further into our um, into our curriculums and into our studies. I mean, the the, the the implications here, and without going now too, too detailed in a, in a curriculum, but the implications in general is, I think, the use of, of physical space in, in the future. So how do you actually run certain outlets that uh, Yasmin and Dana and, and Bente also mentioned before? I mean, how do you organize um, practical learning components in there? Where do you, it's, how do you use technology in, 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 the, in the curriculum? So um, similar as the industry, Technology will decrease uh, human interaction, human touch points, but uh, our digital components and the fewer human human touch points that you have, they need to raise and add value to the academic curriculum. So I think um, the, the use of space and the, the digital versus uh, physical components, I'm, I'm not a big fan of fully online. I, I love blended. So I think there, there's something to do and, and to um, to explore. The other thing is um, a big question that, that I've been asked in the past is like, what about the internationalization? I mean, EHL has 120 nationalities on campus. Um, all these individuals um, are now um, in, in coming to, to EHL also and to other hospitality schools for the, for the cultural variety and the cultural exchanges. Um, so we are asking right now our, ourselves a lot of the questions, and I think this is a, is a fundamental question to ask. If you put somebody in the plane, no matter where it's a business meeting, when, when, no matter whether it is a student coming to campus, um, what is the added value to come to campus? That's really like a question that I, I often ask uh, um, in, in meetings and in my teams and, and where we discuss a lot about it. Like, how do you actually um, make sure that the physical displacement becomes an experience, becomes something that is worth going there, instead of just saying like, okay, this is a classroom. You sit a student in there and this student um, probably follows a course that he or she can also follow um, an online world. So, so how do we um, make sure that we have a value proposition that is valid is a big question that we, that we, that we ask ourselves. And, and with that comes a lot of, um, um, I would say a lot of uh, implications towards our faculty, to our staff, because there is a lot of training linked to it. Um, uh, into into how do you make sure that uh, um, our staff is there? And we lost probably Sina right now and my, our host. But uh, <laughs> I don't know if we're still live or or, or not. We're live. We we're, we're here. We're live. here. Yeah. So so <laughs> we are. I mean, my, my, my point being is basically like. I think there, there are a lot of implications for training and staff and the value proposition that we have to offer. Um, and we need to communicate this much more clearly in the future about it. So in, in that respect, I think uh, um, uh, these are the questions that we are currently ask. What is the COVID-19 implications? And welcome back, Sina, um, in, to our curriculums and to our, our students. So in, I hope I answered this question and you could uh, um, somehow follow. 
Yeah, I think I did. And I think the audience did as well. And then the I question I have is, isn't then maybe the entire academic part of the education probably a part that you move entirely virtually and the challenge is really about the practical education? Is that, how, is that understood correctly then? Yeah, I mean, the, the academic component is a little bit like, um, that goes a little bit into the curriculum implications of the COVID-19 crisis. But I mean, there's always a uh, I would like to maybe separate this. There's a content question and a delivery question that, that you, you raise there um, with this. So the content question is, what are the implications of COVID-19 to, uh, to uh, the academic curriculum? And there are certain topics that uh, have always been uh, um, around. I mean, but it shows that we are, have neglected them in the past. There are new topics coming up. I'm, I'm not sure if um, we need now a hygiene uh, program, but maybe we need a, a safety protocol for uh, and, and uh, for for hospital um, for hotel companies or hospitality companies in general. So in that respect, I think there, there are certain implications of the COVID-19 crisis. But however, there we need to also be um, very careful not to reinvent or not to go hectic right now. I mean, this is a long term. Um, there, there are certain trends, there are long-term um, developments in our industry and what you shouldn't do right now, and this is a, I'm a firm believer, is short-term knee-jerk reactions where you go into a, uh, the redesign of the curriculum and, and say whether or not this makes sense, uh, um, you will find out. So, so I think there's certain things that we need to ask and add to our curriculum, this is for sure. Um, but the, the, the question more is like, what does make sense for the future of the um, evolving, anyway, evolving industry and which skills and competences do we need to provide? And when, when, when it comes to the delivery component, what I mentioned before is a little bit like um, you are now more and more, I think the COVID-19 crisis fast tracked the entire digital discussion, as I mentioned before. But now probably you will have much more digital components in the future and the competition around those digital components will increase. It, instead of having a, a student on campus, you have to have um, a, a, a motivator and a, a tool or a way of making sure that the student is stays in front of the screen and stays and doesn't click on something else or doesn't take another course somewhere else. So um, how do you manage to do this? How do you manage to, to, to go and make um, interesting courses is one, one very um, critical aspect where we all probably need to learn because uh, as I said before, what we do often right now is we put it on, the, on Zoom and think like everything works or, or Teams or, or any other platforms and, and all of a sudden realize, no, it doesn't work. We need to be creative. And I think there will be creative models coming up um, that there are already certain ideas on the market and it will probably revolutionize the, the industry and in how we teach. And uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying, and if you allow me this, I know it's a long, long um, statement from my side, but I, I always felt like when we did three, two years ago, um, the, we have short courses and we have them digital and it allowed us to go into a completely different market where we wouldn't be able to access this market before. So I think there's even a, a, a nice way of uh, um, reaching students and talent and actually bringing people into a discussion, academic discussion through this digital uh, shift um, where, where you weren't there before. And the whole question then you ask yourself is like, whether or not you know in different locations, do you need to follow a two year program or do you need something that is really relevant right now? So that's a little bit the, 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 the whole idea where I think like this is probably academic implications in the long term is what do we teach? How do we teach? What are the, the, the diplomas we give? And maybe we need to be more flexible and online will give us the opportunity to be more flexible and be, to reach people that are um, not able to travel to Europe, to Asia, to, to North America, to Africa, to Latin America or Australia. So in that respect, I know it was a long, long, long answer to your question, but there's the delivery and the academic implications for hospitality schools and university in general, I think they are there. Um, there are lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis and it will be very interesting to see what comes up in the future. Thank you, Achim. And I saw everyone nodding. So I think you're all in agreement with that. And you already answered a bit of it. And also you, Ben, mentioned a few factors of it. Also you, Sina, by saying, for example, that something definitely missing now for the students starting the first year or the second year is the um, social experience they have on campus. And um, I'd like to add a question from someone from the audience that tuned in on Facebook, which is, I hope I said the name correctly, is Friedhof. 
Friedjof Müller. And Friedjof asks, um, says, hello everyone, I'm currently 19 years old and currently applying for the bachelor program at Hotel School The Hague starting in August 2020, so very soon hopefully. And my question would be what influence the current situation will have on me or other future students applying right now. Um, I'd hand this over to actually Bente, being a student like, soon to be graduate student of Hotel School The Hague, what would you advise that person or answer? Um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure what influence the, the current situation would have. I think the program will slightly change, of course, um, according to what is necessary. Uh, so, for example, I think there will be a higher emphasis on people skills and um, providing hospitality, um, not, not only through serving someone from the right-hand side, but through being hospitable yourself, because I think that's what, what the future is going to look like. You cannot in F&B serve someone really uh, the way that it, that it used to be, or at least for now. So then how are you going to provide uh, this warm feeling that that you are supposed to? And I think, um, I'm not sure what, what changes there will be aside from, of course, the practical aspects touched upon earlier um, already. Um, but I think that the, the curriculum will shape itself according to the needs of the of the students and of the future uh, industry right now and i think that's all we can say is we all don't don't really know what's going to happen of course yeah well definitely Friedhof can prepare himself to be part of a co-creation as jasmine uh, already mentioned before and dana said as well everyone is in the try and error process right now and the students are involved virtually and are in contact with the teachers and the programs are running because if I understood correctly, there is no break and hold in any of the program elements, right? And both schools, you are trying to get it all online. Jasmine? Yeah, I just want to say, uh, I really want to underline one point, which both Bente and also Achim said, um, also to uh, Fritjof, if I pr pronounce that correctly, we're very eager to uh, see you come to our school and welcome you with both our open arms, which you can't see uh, physically. But it doesn't mean that our content changes. It doesn't mean that the theories and the, and the curriculum setup we currently have all of a sudden needs to shift. I think it's a mindset sh shift in terms of your leader competencies. And that's where I come back again to the resilience component. I mean, imagine the very basic theory of Maslow where the first layer is about health and, and, and safety needs. We maybe need to touch upon that a bit more in, in uh, thoroughness, but we don't need to change our practical elements in terms of how we deal with those, but our, our almost strategic and business leader mindset to be able to take some room to empathize on that and I think if I speak for the audience or sorry the panel we have here we are both schools which perform in a very very adequate way on that because that's where we are known for um, and I think we can only polish that and create a unique um, proposition much more towards that like Ahim also said um, so yeah Fritjof don't you worry we're all here in this in this boat together and especially if you're a starting student you will go into history books as the one who started during COVID-19 you will have hopefully a track of four years time where you will graduate and share your experiences with us in a panel, um, so to say. Thank you. And Sina, um, considering this question would have been asked to you as someone doing the master right now, theoretically, what would you say? Well, what is going to, to change um, maybe is the, you know, the, the thing which is important about, for example, EHL, maybe next to um, the educational aspect, it's the networking, it's um, will you be able to have, you know, the group works and, you know, um, people coming to class and, you know, talking about the industry or um, so for if somebody would ask me about the, the master's degree, um, you know, the school is really trying to do their best. And academically, I feel like I get the same. Um, so for someone starting now, um, except for the issues, you know, how to maybe come into Switzerland and start studying, um, I feel like it's very important to keep on going because we don't know what is going to happen. Um, maybe, um, by the end of the year, there is a vaccine and everything goes back to normal or like the old normal, let's say it that way, which I don't really expect, but, um, there really is so much uncertainty that I feel it would be wrong to change it all up now because um, there is really 
no way to know now. So um, it's really important to keep on um, providing the values that you know we've we've learned so far, and that the service industry keeps the values and keeps the basics um, that have been you know anchored in us so so much. Um, that you know, little things like okay, maybe you'll have to provide the service with two meters distance. Okay, but I think that is something that can really, you know, be tied together, and therefore we shouldn't we shouldn't be changing up too much. And therefore, um, the Mister Mister Miller <laughs> shouldn't be worried. Um, I'm sure that we'll make the best out of it, and he will get a, a great education. And in, within four years' time, he'll be starting into you know, um, hopefully. A recovered industry. Thank you, Sina. And um, I just absolutely agree. And free talk to you again as well. Um, I think the education you will get for the hospitality industry will prepare you for any inconvenience you might encounter in your career. And I can say from my own experience, although I had the luxury of having the practical elements, but still like the emphasis on communication, feedback, and just being adjustable to every situation and just embrace it and just be open minded. That's something you will learn definitely in, in our industry. So we're looking forward to have you as a part of our industry. Um, so th th this, I think there's no other questions from the audience right now. And there was another topic I wanted to touch on um, quickly, because just based on the experience we just made ourselves with Tech Talk Travel, which I found was very impressive with the students that we're having at the um, current online programs. It's first year students, right? So they don't have many experience. They met us as uh, industry representatives in an online meeting, 10 of them um, being presented with a task and just the way how sound and professional and calm and open minded they reacted to it. It was very impressive. And um, I was also lucky enough to be part of the opening session. And there was a topic about topic of networking. And what I feel, though, as an opportunity, and I don't know if you in the group agree and I would like to discuss this, it opens up an opportunity as well to kind of build a different intensity of a network, looking at the virtual opportunities you do have. Because just as a really concrete and practical example, like just in the last five days, I connected with more students from hotel schools via LinkedIn and short messages than I would have ever been doing that in the last two years when I was in my career, um, if it would have been a normal situation, right? There would have been a student arriving at the um, company. There would have been someone welcoming the person. I would have probably had a coffee, coffee with that person. And then I would have to do my own stuff and my own appointments. And so I think there is a chance in creating a network and a relationship with the people in a very direct way, if you know how to set this up, the communication skills wise. So what is your take on that? Shouldn't we maybe explore into that opportunity for the students listening right now, how to build their network virtually? Yeah, Benta, please. Great. Yeah, definitely. And I have actually seen a very big increase in students being on LinkedIn. I think ever since the uh, crisis started, I've gotten so many LinkedIn invites from students who I know personally. But I think this is a very good sign. I think that shows um, that students are adapting and are already... Um, doing this naturally, I think, without without being told, because you can feel that something is missing and you try to find alternative ways um, to achieve this. And I think online, um, online, we can definitely also achieve this just in a different way, but that's also all right. Like we need to look at this um, not from a negative point of view, but from a positive point of view. Maybe in the future, an online network might be even more useful because you will have access and it will, as we can see right now, become much more important to have this online presence. So in, in that way, you can definitely, I think, strengthen your network, um, I suppose, to before all this happened. Right. And I would, I would like to add on, on, on that, Benta. Um, I think, I think uh, I, I've noticed the same. I got a lot of LinkedIn invitations. And um, I think that that is something for us where we can, uh, where we can support the students more now in the, in the, in the short and long, long-term future. Because in, in, usually we, we, teach, we teach our students how to present yourself in a live setting, in front of a live audience, uh, in one-on-one -on -one conversations. And now uh, we can add on that skill set, okay, how do I present myself online? How does my LinkedIn profile, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the employee, employee branding, so to say. And um, I think that, that, that gives a lot of room for, um, for new skills to learn. Zina, you wanted to say something as well. Thank you, Dana. Yes, I just um, I wanted to also add to this that you know for for many people as now that we had online classes uh, we were 
uh, able to have much more panelists because people only have to take actually this one hour, um, you know, physically that they're, um, you know, online. So uh, I had, for example, a marketing class and we had uh, panelists, uh, like uh, guest speakers every day for an hour, um, which would have maybe not been possible. They couldn't have come to Bangkok or, um, you know, uh, the time just wasn't, you know, sufficient. So you can kind of meet many more people this way too. Um, and also maybe, you know, for, for many people starting a hospitality school, so it's, it's less of a barrier, maybe, you know, some people might be, you know, a bit uh, scared to, you know, just go up to people and maybe just talk to them, let's say at an event or something, but maybe it makes it easier to, to, to do this online. It, it takes kind of the barrier away. So I feel, um, building a network online could definitely, could definitely be a very successful way to, to network. Great. And I think also, him. Oh, okay. I, I, I quick jump in. Uh, and that judgment right after. That's great. Yeah. Oh, sorry, please. Yeah. Gentlemen first. No, 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 Dr. Schmidt, you're first. What <laughs> <laughs> um, what I wanted to, to to bring back because I was uh, um, interviewing um, some 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 chairman and CEOs recently, and I don't know if you share this uh, um, feeling. What I feel about this social networking aspect and in, engaging over. Um, those those online media is this COVID crisis made um, professionals more human. So um, what I discovered actually is you see someone sitting in his uh, um, in, in his in his um, couch or in his office space at home if they have an office space sometimes with kids uh, on the arm because they have uh, so much to do and, and they need to somehow if schools are closed they need to to, to exchange with with their with their spouses, how they handle the kids and everything. And all of a sudden, you're, you're usually you go through, I don't know, assistants and, and, and the executive offices. And, and then you sit in front of someone that is uh, um, intimidating just by the office setup already. And then you say like, okay, let, let, let's get it. And it's very formal. And all of a sudden here, it gets sometimes very informal, very quickly. So it gets very personal. It gets, um, um, it, it, people open up much more because we are all affected similarly. So I think there is a greater um, um, access to humans and uh, uh, the, the human element in conversations is much, um, it's ele elevated a little bit. And I think this is something that made, it was very nice to discover. It's something positive, I feel, to discover throughout the, the pandemic that um, people are opening up more and maybe also see like uh, they're interested in how others live emotionally the, these aspects, which goes back a little bit into the discussion of Dana and, and Yasmin before also that they said like, look, uh, these communication skills and, 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 and remote uh, interactions, I think we, we, we learn all a lot about how to do this in the future. Great, Achim. Thank you. Jasmine, what was your take on that? What do you want to yeah, add? Yeah, no, this is exactly the take. I think I also host courses where we connect with students to find consultancy projects with external companies, which is which can be very challenging because, yeah, you have to knock on somebody's door and how do you get in touch? And there are five different layers. But I totally agree with Achim. Those layers are gone because people somehow want to connect because we are sitting. I mean, I can show you I'm sitting at home right now. I've sent my husband and daughter away and I'm sitting here and you start to share those stories. Normally I wouldn't share a lot of personal stories like that, but you just have the starting layer is very different. And then, oh, business comes last. Yeah, sure, we can help you. I can look into that and can see what I, how I can connect you. The willingness to support and help each other and the fact that we are doing fine is already something we don't take for granted anymore. And I think that gives a great opportunity also for us as, as professionals to learn from and I see quite a lot of students I'm learning from our students a lot because they pick it up and hop they go with it and I think that uh, gives a nice yeah positive layer to what we are negatively experiencing. Thank you Jasmine I absolutely agree and just to, to give you a back, background of where I am right now because I had to escape my home office with my little daughter um, going so crazy sometimes because she wants to talk to you as well so I'm luckily sitting in the hotel next door, Big Mama, uh, from David Friedemann hanging in Berlin. And he just said, Leah, you can have a room. Just come over and use it. So thank you to a like, shout out to that team. And I think that that's, that's also something I wanted to add because you mentioned it very early, Achim, with um, some trends in the industry going on. There were things already evolving and now they're just accelerated by COVID-19 or the current situation, right? And speaking of the various layers and hierarchy or the not being able to reach the decision taker. I think there was a progress already in the industry and now it's just, 
moving even faster, which is a good thing if we look at it from that perspective. And looking at the time, I think it's just great that we are in an optimistic state now of the conversation, closing this off. And I just wanted to ask in around, is there another topic that you really wanted to talk about that we didn't cover so far? Because we still have a bit of time, so we could cover another additional point. Yeah, maybe I, I want to just make a comment, not an additional point, um, if, I, if I may. So um, someone once said, like, you meet the nicest people in hospitality. And I, I, I truly believe that there's a truth to this saying. And what I feel is uh, um, this industry, given that it's one of the industries that is heavily impacted by the COVID-19 crisis, um, and, and universities are similarly around the globe also very heavily impacted, I'm very confident that we get out there together because in the past, what the industry has shown, and that's why we, we are we are global industry and we work very well together, is that um, actually the 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 we are not so much in 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 competition if you think about it because our industry it's a passion it's something that we share we share uh, hospitality values and um, I'm very confident uh, and that's just my feeling that. Every time I reach out to another colleague at another university, they are always there. They always help the the, the practitioners. Um, you see the the how hospitality companies and the hospitality professionals help their community um, by helping um, food by giving. You mentioned the the room space. So I'm very very um, sharing a little bit of pride about this industry, how we handle this with a human human element. And I think like. A, that's something I, I wanted to, to, to mention in general. A big thank you to, to, to all hospitality professionals out there that actually um, make this, uh, um, yeah, uh, make this a, a, a tough, it's a tough situation for all of us, but they make it bearable by being so helpful and being so service oriented towards ourselves. So it's something that is a pleasure to witness and uh, it's not really uh, something that uh, you witness very often. So in that respect, this was just something that I would like to, to use the stage to mention it and a uh, great panel that we have here to, to also share a little bit what, what's happening out there and we don't hide anything. Thank you, Achim. Well, so yeah, Jasmine, please. No, no, I just want, I also don't have a point to raise and um, people who know me will know that, but I just want to say to everyone in, in this room, so to say, be proud of what you've been achieving. You've made it already two months down the line of COVID-19. We are all facing the same challenges. And I really would like to say also to the audience, feel welcome to reach out. And I'm sure if I speak for all of us in the panel, reach out to us. If you have questions, reach out. We can only help you take feelings or fears or anxiety away if we talk about it. And we may not have the answer, but we'll help you to get to an answer, which may be not satisfying with a yes or no right away but we can learn from it also. And I really want you to go back to yourself and you're great as you are. And you're in this session, you try to learn, we all try to do that. And if you reach out and connect with, with us or with anyone else you are of interest with, do so. Because we all have a warm heart for this great industry as I share with Achim. And yeah, I will take that into my next life also. So yeah, that's just a sunny Friday note. All right, Bente and Sina, will you have a closing note as well for all the students tuning in, uh, looking at their career to come? Yeah, I think something that we are taught in hospitality education is that uh, we are prepared for changes and we are prepared for leading ourselves and leading others through changes like this. And I think that's what's happening at this moment. And I do agree that to some extent, this is hospitality is uniting everyone right now. So I think people who normally maybe wouldn't experience hospitality in the way that they are experiencing it now, um, they are getting to know the concept. And I think th that opens up opportunities for us in the future. So I think we need to uh, keep an optimistic outlook on the situation, uh, especially by knowing that we, we can make it through this and that this is kind of what we are prepared for, even though we don't know what to expect. Thank you, Penta. Zina? Yeah, also from my side, um just stay optimistic and, you know, don't lose hope in the industry. Um, you know, still keep on, you know, this is a really great education. And I'm very proud to be, you know, a part of, of EHL. And I'm sure you are with um, uh, Hotel School in Den, Den Haag. Um, so this is definitely something that should be continued because, you know, hospitality and tourism is, is, is going to come back and there will be new challenges and, um, it's just so um, flexible and 
creative and you know we will the people working in hospitality are really truly you know unique people and it's just a pleasure to be a part of this and um i hope that when we all work together we'll find a way out of this uh quite fastly great and dana any closing remarks from you before we uh, round up um yes well i obviously agree on everything uh that the others just have said but to to add on that i for me the past two months they feel like a much longer period of time because they were so full of learnings yeah it's like every day i'm learning something new about myself about my students about the content that we're doing and and that's something also that I th think that keeps me so so positive also through the situation. And, and that's something that I would like to to invite yeah, everyone to do, but especially also our students. Right. So we're all back to the, to the topics we started with as well. It's all about resilience. It's lifelong learning. It's being optimistic, being open. Um, well, um, thank you very much for being our guest today and sharing your views that openly. I don't think this is um, without saying doing this that openly in this format. Thank you for your trust and taking the time. We do appreciate that very much. And um, to everyone uh, listening and watching, or maybe later on as well, um, we will provide this session as we also did with the last ones um, as recap media on our website, on Tech Talk Travel, also on our app. So you will have it available as a video, as a podcast, and later on also a executive summary or an article. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And just let's stay optimistic and hope um, we get through this as we are all in this together. And there was the actual consensus of all the sessions we had so far. So I think we can all agree on that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and Leah, for hosting Thank us. you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And thank have you. a great weekend ahead. Many thanks. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.